Hi. Right. Good morning. We can get started. So good morning. Um, so you probably got the email, my last email, right? So we'll have the uh, the test on Wednesday. But for all the exams, um, we will we will cover whatever we did till that point, right? So for Wednesday's class, we will cover whatever was taught till uh, Monday, right? I expect you to keep up with the book, and if this, you know, I hope the book should be easy to read because I don't think the book is um, should be very hard to read before you come to class, right? We are supposed to have a, a surprise quiz, kind of waiting for us to collect enough material so we can actually have a quiz, right? Um, right? So if you have any questions about anything, let me know. I mean, what have we covered so far and stuff, right? So do you have any questions in the stuff we covered la in the last class? So last class we kind of started the the first module, which is talking about processes, right? And we are talking about processes as the way for the operating system to know when a program is running, way for it to give it resources, way for it to store whatever uh, structure, whatever context it needs to do when it does a, does a context switch. So if it's trying trying to move from one process to another process, it uses that as a scratch space, uh, what have you, right? And the data structure it uses inside is a process control block which is a large chunk of memory for whatever the operating system needs to use for that, right? And we're going to continue on with that to talk a little bit about how to create processes, how to delete processes, and, and things of that nature uh, in this lecture before talking about threads, right? So the, the first notion is the notion of how to create a process. So we need to figure out how to create a process because once you create a process, the operating system is supposed to hold all the contents on the process control block, right? To create a process, the, there are slightly different variants of the same concept. Essentially, you create a copy of yourself, you create a clone of yourself, right? And then you have a way to replace yourself with another program, right? So those are the two ways you create a new process. And a particular operating system may call that using one one system call. Essentially what happens is to create a process, you need to have a process. A process can create another process, right? You can't create a process out of thin air, so you have to create a new process through two steps. One is to create a clone of yourself, and then let the clone replace itself with another, uh, another program, right? The, the process of cloning is usually done in Unix uh, using a function called call fork, which essentially creates an identical copy of your running program. So when you do a fork, we'll see in a little bit what the example program looks like. When you do a fork, it creates the exact copy of, of the current process, right? And both the processes will start running from the next statement after fork. Both the processes will have all the stuff that was there before the fork happened. Like, so all the variables that they had before the fork would be shared. But everything else after that is separate, so they don't share the contents. They are separate processes by themselves, right? And then the notion of exec would say, if you call exec, it essentially changes you to another program. And I see the example in the next slide, right? So that's a way for you to create a process. So that means you always create the sort of a tree, right? You call the one which is creating you as a parent and the one that is created as a child. And if you think of that, it's, it's sort of like a binary tree, right? You have to have one root process which is usually created by the operating system. You cannot do anything with that, it's a special process. And that creates other processes which create other processes and, and so on and so forth. And depending on the operating system, you may de decide that the child will inherit some or all resources, right? Because otherwise, so you have to understand what is, what is happening because after you do a fork, both the parent and the child will have, to, will have the same copies but you have to figure out what that sharing means. We'll see some of it as we as we move along in the class. You know, you don't want it to be unknown, but you the specific mechanism depends on the particular operating system, right? The specific mechanism may be if you have a file open before you do a fork, what happens if both of the both the parent and the child starts to write, right? So that's what the, that's the, the the creation process. The exit process is the notion of how do you kill a process, right? The, the process can be killed. When you do an exit from your program, right, which may be exit or underscore exit, depending on how, how you call that from your, from your program, 
essentially that, that will clean up all the stuff. It will clean up the process control block. It will release all the resources that the process held and give it back to the operating system. It could be you know, good exit, like an exit, or it could be a abort or something where the program exits without the user control, right? Without the user having too much input. So if you do a segmentation violation, then the, use, the operating system may have to, may give you a warning, but you may have to kill you, right? So there are different ways of exiting, you know, um, abnormal or normal exit. So essentially these two would create a new PCB, the, the process creation, and exit would clean out the process control block. So it can be given to another process, it can be done with another person, right? So to make stuff a little bit clearer, uh, the, the book has a little example on how to use the fork system called to create a new process, right? This is a very simple program. Essentially, you have a main function, right? Um, you have a PID underscore T, which is a syn syntactic sugar for what a process is called in a particular operating system. In Unix, this is tends to be integer, right? So this is most of the stuff for integer. So this is an integer value. But Essentially, that defined, that's the name of a new process, right? So in, the, in this process, the first line we uh, uh, execute is a fork, right? And then we return the, whatever fork returns, we put it in the PID. What fork returns is, is the process ID of the child, right? So if you are the parent, it returns the process ID of the new process. If you are the child, it returns zero because there is there's no child. It, it is a child, right? So that's the only way for you to differentiate between whether you are the parent or child, right? There is not really, even though we call it as a parent and child, there is not really that much of a elevation of what parent can do or the child can do, right? Both of them can do the same thing. Both of them are co-equal, but you call one a parent, one a child, and the way you differentiate that is when fork returns, it either returns, if, if it couldn't fork for whatever reason, right, maybe because of a long-term scheduler problem, it'll return an error, error message, it'll return a negative one, in which case it's supposed to, you can say the fork failed. Otherwise, if you do a, if you check for the process ID to be, if it's zero, that means you're the child because you, you're, you know, you're the child. But for the parent, it returns the process ID of the child, right? And you could use this to kill the process. You can use this to control the child, but not in a special, any special way. I mean, any process can, if you have the privileges, you can kill another process and stuff like that, right? So even though it's called a parent and child, don't think of that as a human, kind of like a parent and child where the parent has control over the children, right? The only other way it may happen, the system may do is, the child, when it exits, it may not, so it returns the error code back to the parent. So when you do an exit with a value of minus one or something, that is supposed to be returned to the parent, right? So that's one other way where the parent has some significance. It, it, waits, it, it can get the status of how the child exited, and which, it, which can do something with it or it can throw away, right? So in this case, we check for whether it's a parent or a child, right? If PID equals zero, that means you are the child because there's no parent for you. This exec basically says, replace the copy of the program with this new program, right? Your new pro so you create a clone of yourself. The child clone basically says, replace myself with this new program, which you read from disk, which is uh, LS in this case. So that's a way for you to create a new process which is different from who you are, right? It doesn't have to do exec, it can, it can do some com computation here, but if it does an exec, that means it'll be replaced. So the child would end up doing uh, a, a list command, whereas the parent would come here and wait for what the list command returned, and then it'll print something and then exit, right? Does that make sense? There are multiple variants of, of this call depending on the particular operating system, but essentially that's what you tend, tend to do. You create a clone of yourself, and then you replace it with something else. You don't have to replace it, you can run your different program here, and that's just fine, right? The one thing to remember is, whatever you did before you did the fork is shared by both the processes, right? So if you had computed some number there before you did the fork, and the value happens to be four, right? Once you do a fork, 
both of them will have a copy of that value. Both of them will be able to modify their own copy of the value. But that value will not reflect on the other one, right? So if the parent changes the value from four to five, the child will not see the new value, right? So you essentially create a clone, but the values are not shared anymore, right? Does that make sense? So when you, when you do a fork, you get a copy of all the stuff you had at the moment of the fork, and after that, you're, all, you're on your own. You're, you're, you can modify stuff differently, you can do stuff differently. And that may or may not be okay for your application, right? There are conditions where you don't want that, you want them to continue to share. We'll see some of the primitives in the, in the next few slides. But essentially, the fork will create a copy of all the stuff you had, right? Which you are free to modify, but it's not reflected on the other side. You have an entire new copy, right? And this is significant because you, the, the, some other stuff will, will come back uh, in terms of optimizing this process. Right? The, the problem here is when you create a copy of all the stuff, if you had lots of resources, if you're using lots of memory, if you're using lots of arrays and stuff, you have to create an entire copy of all the contents. Right? And we'll see some optimization later on which you don't have to do all that explicit stuff. But essentially, you're creating an entire copy of the thing. Right? So depending on the operating system, this may mean that if you had a file open before, right, you have to define what, what it means for the two, two processes. Right? Both of them have the thing open. Both of them should be able to write to it. But how, how that works, what that matters, depends on the operating system. Because if, it, if it's not done right, then you may have things running over each other. Right? And it, it'll be more clearer as we go along on why, why these things will fail. Right? So the notion of the fork is, Clear, right? So one of the things I mentioned was when you do a, when you do a copy, when you create a new process, you get a copy of all the contents, but you don't get to modify these things. So if you want these things to be independent, if they don't want to be cooperating with each other, that's a good enough abstraction. But if you want them to sort of fork each other and then want to collaborate, then want to compute something together, right? Can you think of a reason why you would want to do a fork and continue to compute on the same data through two processes? So the example I gave here was you fork and you create another program. You create a fork and then you create run a program called LS, right? But is there a reason why you would want to fork but not run something else but run a different piece of code? Try to run, run the same code or, or what have you, right? Yes? Something like rendering, which is really parallelizable. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's the key? So that you can run them, if you had like multiple processors or multiple cores, Exactly. So, so when you do, a, when you create a new process, right? the operating system can give it a processor, right? So if you want it to processor, because you happen to be on a multiprocessor machine, that's one way to get that, right? So when you do a fork, you are creating two processors, so the operating system has to treat, treat them both equally. So it could give one of each one of them a different amount of processor. So it's possible that if you have two processors, you may get two processors for the same process, right? You won't be able to share stuff, but if you could, then that's one way to do that, right? So this is a way for you to get more CPU resources, because every time you create a new process, you get a new processor assigned to you, right? The problem is you can't modify whatever in the parent. So some cases it works very nice. So for example, the example you gave, which is rendering something, right? For example, if you want to print some document, you have you created all the data, right? You're not gonna modify it. So you can call the child and say, Go ahead and render it, make it ready for the printer, right? Since I created a fork, the operating system will give you a separate process to, pro, processor to modify that, right? And this little child can work along with you, concurrently with you. So if you have two processor machine, it will look like you're working twice as fast as one processor, right? But the challenge here is you can't really share the stuff. So the child cannot modify anything that the parent can know, or the parent cannot modify anything and let the child know. Right. So the abstraction you want to create for that is the notion of a shared memory. Right? There are two ways of sharing stuff. One is called a shared memory and one is called message passing. But essentially those are designed for 
two core printing processes to somehow say, whatever I modify, I want to let the other process know, because I don't want to be completely independent. Right? So the notion of um, shared memory is actually, you need to get the operating system to help you. We'll see a little bit of that when you talk about the memory. We'll, actually, we'll see a lot more of it when you talk about memory uh, stuff. The idea here is somehow you have to say on process A, right, which may be the parent, and process B, some chunk of memory would be shared, right? So that means that the operating system has to get involved, and we'll see why, of course, actually in the, in the third, um, third module. But essentially, once it happens, it looks like you'll have one chunk of memory that is set up right, such that if one process writes, the other process will see it. Right? And that's a way for both of them to collaborate because if one writes, the other one sees it, and the other one writes, the other one sees it. Right? But you have to be careful on how you do this stuff. You can't just do it without control because I have to only modify with the process that I have, I have control over. Right? I don't want to be able to attach to your process and share stuff with your process unless you give me explicit control. Right? So it's not as trivial as me saying, I want this to be shared. We all have to collaborate. We all have to make sure that we have the right privileges and we want to do what you want to do. And we'll also see that this is not a trivial task because if you, if you don't coordinate what we're doing, this can completely mess us up. I'll give you an example of how this is bad. But essentially, the second module talks about how you deal with that. Right? And, and, and the answer we use for that is called logs. Essentially, the idea here is if you have a scratch space that we all can operate on. right? Suppose we all sit here, and we have one piece of paper that we can use to write a um, novel, let's say. right? Imagine the problem if there was no coordination, we all can write, right? So you'll write something, you'll write something, you'll write something, you'll write something. We'll overwrite each other, we'll add stuff to each other, you'll, you'll have gibberish. So we have to make sure that these things happen in orderly fashion. And that's a sufficiently large problem that we have a whole module just for that, right? But essentially, this is, this is what you want to do. And so for example, for example here, right? Like, so we're not going to go into detail of how this happens. Suppose we made a buffer shared between two processes, right? Buffer of size buffer, right? No, buffer size. And we'll see an example of how you, you may share this stuff, right? The, the idea of, of how you share that involves you. So the, there are two processes, right? One is writing into this buffer, one is reading from this buffer. We'll see more of, of the same example later on when, this, when the bugs in this code is fixed, right? We can't fix them till we go to module two because we don't have any way of coordination. But what we're trying to do is we want to make sure that once one process writes something, the other process can read from it, right? Because they're sharing the same, same buffer, right? So the example here is one of them is producing, one of them is consuming. This is a producer-consumer problem, which is a very classical problem in operating system. Right? The idea here is the producer will produce. He'll keep producing as much as it can, but bounded by the buffer. It cannot produce more than the buffer till the consumer takes it. Right? So you want the producer to keep producing up to a certain point, and the consumer to take stuff off the buffer. Right? And in, in equilibrium, producer is producing stuff, and then the consumer is taking stuff off of it. So they're both coordinating through this shared structure where you're sending work from the producer to the consumer through this shared buffer. Right? You also need a mechanism, which is not explained here, of what happens if the producer is too fast. If the producer is producing stuff too fast, then you have to make the producer wait till the buffer clears up. Right? And you also have to have the same thing for the consumer. Right? The consumer may, may come too, too fast. It does not have enough force. It has to wait. Right? So without going into all the detail, what you're trying to do is you are using this, um, the, the two variables called in and out. Right? Which is a, you're, you're creating this as a circular buffer. Right? So in and out are used to keep track of how where it is. So the producer keeps track of how far it is using the in, and the consumer takes it based on the out value, right? So you want to keep these two pointers, so if they tend to be further out, that means the producer is full, right? So the producer uses that to figure out how much to do, right? I'm going to leave the example of how you work through this code uh, uh, offline, right? Essentially, it's a circular buffer, right? And 
And so you use this to keep adding stuff. There's a lot of problems with this because they are both operating on the same variable, so they can run over each other, right? And we need other structures we'll see later. But essentially, you can use something like this to share stuff, and that's a, that's a good thing, because otherwise, you are left with, I can give you two processors, but those processors cannot really collaborate with each other, and that's not a good thing, right? So one is a shared memory abstraction. The next abstraction we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look at is the notion of a message passing, which is very similar to what you'll see when you take a networking close, right? So here there are two processes. They don't share a memory. They basically create a message and send it to the other process. So they, they create something, send it to another process. And the other process will operate on that, right? So they have a notion of a send and a receive. So the sender will send, receiver will receive, right? It's very similar to the networking. If you took a networking class, you know, you use sockets and stuff to send these stuff. The, the difference is in the notion of how do you do some of the operations that you do in sockets. How many of you taken a networking class? Oh, there's a fair amount of people have taken a networking class. One of the, one of the problems with the send, send stuff that you, uh, if you're talking networking classes, I have to know who I'm sending it to, right? So I have, that means I have to have a name, right? In the networking class, you might have studied of machine names like www.nd.edu or, or something like that. Whereas here, you have to create this notion of a name which, is, which matters only within the same operating system, right? So you have to create some name to, to call these things. So I, I, I don't send a, send a message to, I don't know what your process is, so I have to have a name mechanism to say, I want to send it to PowerPoint print render or something. So I need to have this notion of a name. That is, of course, defined by the operating system. That may or may not be known to normal people, but that's, you have to have a way of specifying that. Right? The other problem with, 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 when you deal with the networking stuff is, if the other machine is offline or something, you have some time for somebody to wait and retransmit and, and so on and so forth. Within an operating system, there is not much of a uh, uh, leeway like that. Right? You don't have infinite buffers and stuff. So you may have to force the other process to be um, buffer bound. So if you're sending too fast, in the real network, you may be tolerant to do some things. Within a kernel, you have a lot less, uh, lot less buffer. So you may expect that the, when you send a message, the other side has to receive it immediately or it's, it's lost. Right? So there are slight variations in the networking code, but essentially that's just what you try to do. Right? And this is one of the abstractions that uh, operating systems like Mac, or the mock operating system that Mac uses, would use to communicate with each other, right? They, they call this ports, and they send messages to each processor through ports. It's like a sort of like a mailbox. So if I want to send a message to a rendering process, I send it to the rendering uh, post mailbox, and then the renderer would take stuff off of that mailbox, right? So these are two mechanisms to, to for processors to communicate. We're not going into the detail of how they will go, and I think we'll, we'll actually talk more about the uh, shared memory um, in, the, in this and the next module, right? So essentially, th these kind of stuff would gives you some set of a notion of processes, how the operating operating system uh, um, represents them internally, how you create them, how you delete them, and how you may share them, right? And of course, all the information about what is being shared, what is not being shared, will have to be stored on the PCB. So the PCB will have to have space for the operating system to keep track of what is being shared and what is not being shared, and so on. Right? Does that make sense? So I'm actually going to go to the, the next chapter, which is the notion of threads. Right? The notion of threads used to be not as important just a few years back. But now I don't think there is, there is any possible way you can take operating systems without knowing about threads. The notion of threads says that in the, in the, when you talk about a process, you only had one way of giving a CPU to you. There's only one way of giving a processor to you, unless you do a fork. And when you do a fork, you have to explicitly do the sharing and all those things. But most of the world is going towards multi-core machines, right? If you, if you buy a new machine, it's very hard for you to ask for a single core. It's very hard for you to ask for a single processor, right? So when you have multiple processors, Right? How many of you have a desktop which has multiple processors? Right? Desktop or laptop, uh, they call a multiple core, right? Actually, very few of you, right? Um, I'm kind of surprised, but I think if you buy a new machine right now, it's very hard for you to look for a single processor, right? So I'm supposing that most of you have a 
slightly older computer. But right now, it's, it's practically not cost effective for you to buy a single processor, right? And, and, the, and the reasons are entirely hardware oriented. The reasons are you're hitting a wall on how fast you can make things go. So it's not possible for you to make a four gigahertz processor, right? But it's much cheaper for you to make two two gigahertz processor or two two gigahertz core, which is where, where the where the market is going. Right? They can't keep this st the, the stuff going faster and faster, but they can add more, right? I think Intel is uh, proposing that within the next few years they're going to go up to like 40 cores or something. They they can keep going as many cores as possible, right? So when you have more cores, you don't have each core is typically not as fast as the single processor, right? So for, but you have more cores. So if when you write a program, if you want to use all the cores available to you to do your process, you have to have a way of giving all the processes to your, to your process, right? And that's not possible in the traditional model because when you write a program, you, you think of it as a straight end of execution, right? So the way you do that is the, through the notion of a thread, right? Threads is a way for a process to have multiple processors assigned to it, and you expect that the different threads of control to be simultaneously operating within the same process, right? And we'll, we'll and, and the key is the threads will share everything else, right? When you, when you create a new thread, all the threads within the process have share everything else. There's no, no problem with anything. You can share anything. Right? Which may be a good thing or a bad thing. We'll see how it's a bad thing in, in the next lecture. But you, have, you can share whatever you want. Right? So conceptually, this is what happens. When you talk about a process, you have a single thread of execution, whatever you, your code was, whatever you're thinking of executing. Right? And it has all the stacks and files and all those things. When you do a fork, you essentially create a new copy of this. Right? And then they are all, they're both independent. They both have one single thread, and then they can communicate with each other or what have you. The notion of a thread says that you still have the same stuff up there, right? You may have some stuff that is not shared, right? You, you have to keep a context of where you're going. So the registers and stack would have to be, would, cannot be shared, should not be shared, right? You can still access them, but it's not really shared, because otherwise both the, all the threads will have to do the exact same thing. But essentially, your process will have multiple things going on at the same time. So depending on how you schedule this notion into the hardware, uh, hardware, you may have multiple things running at the same exact time or differently, right? For example, if you're running on a single processor machine, you only have one CPU. So you can't really do anything even if you have three threads. Even if you have three threads, somehow only one thread can be running at any one instant. But if you're running on a, on a machine with, say, four processors, this particular example, it's possible that all three threads are running at the exact same time. They can all be modifying at the exact same time. So yeah, at the ideal conditions, if this process looks like it's going at 1x speed, this will look like it's going at 3x speed. Right? It's not always possible because you may have to stop and synchronize with each other. But it's possible that all of them, they're completely independent to go at three times the speed. So as you get more and more processors, you have to have more and more threads to get the performance out of it. Right? So you are kind of forced to deal with threads because there's no other way for you to use the hardware. The hardware trend is towards multiple cores, and the way for you to use that is through threads. Right? I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a threads, uh, threading code. So we'll, we'll talk about through two functions, right? This is again in, in C, right? And this is using the P threads, which is a portable thread library, right? And there are, there are two functions which are sort of boring. They're not, they don't do actually add too much. So the first function is add runner, right? It keeps adding to some shared variables, and the sub runner will subtract from something, something from a shared variable, right? So they are given a parameter argument as a string, right, of, of some count. So they'll add that much. The add runner will add that much. A sub runner will subtract that much, right? So basically, it, it goes through a loop and then adds uh, that many times. And this goes through a loop and subtracts that many times, right? So you may wonder why I just don't do you know, sum equals plus equals upper, right? But I'm trying to do this to make a point, right? So the point here is, if you think of this execution, the add goes through a loop, 
right? And keeps writing into this shared data structure called sum, right? That many times, and the and the and the sub the subtract one subtracts that much, right? Really simple programs don't do anything useful. So now we put this into a, a third third program, right? So there are some functions that you can safely ignore. I mean, these are necessary for these things to work. You can look at the manual pages of what they mean. So for example, in this, this main program, now we have to have this notion of a pet, you know, p thread uh, uh, data structure. Right? So you need to have this TID and ATTR. Some of this code, you just, you know, just copy it and, and, and work on it. You don't have to worry about why they're needed. right? So essentially, create this p thread library here, p thread ATTR underscore in it with the attribute. right? You have to do that. So then you create these two, you do a p-thread create with a certain set of arguments, right? You create an argument where you said, you want to find out what the thread ID was. In this case, you're kind of ignoring it. You have to say what p-thread library you initialized, the editor, what function you want to run, right? And the argument you want to pass to it. In this case, it's passed as a command line argument, right? So you run add runner, you run subtract runner, right? And then I have this little program loop here, right? Something here which for 50 times it prints out what the value of sum is, right? The so sum is a global variable here. Sum is a, uh, at the top there's a global variable called sum that is shared among all these, uh, is shared for the whole process, right? So I created an add, add runner, I created a sub runner, and I go through 50 times to print the value of sum, right? And then I have this p thread join, we'll see what, what it is a little bit, and then I print the sum again, right? So if this was a normal program and we didn't have anything called uh, uh, threads and stuff, right? What you expect to happen is you call add runner, let's say you call this program with a value of 100, right? So you expect to call add runner with a value of 100, and your program will go through and add 100 times to the sum, so it'll become, sum will become 100. Then you're calling subrunner with 100, so it'll go back to zero. Then you have 50 times you print 0, 0, 0, 0. Let's ignore this for a moment. And then you print this stuff, it'll be zero, right? This is kind of a boring program. This is like a pointless program because you add up to 100, add up to whatever number you gave, subtract down to zero, and then you print this stuff, right? I encourage you to try this program on, on a multiprocessor machine, especially like most, I mean, all the machines there are, are, are multiprocessor machine, dual core or, or multiprocessor. If you run on a multiprocessor machine, what pthread create does is it creates another thread within your process and it can go independently of the rest of the stuff, right? So what really happens is you have the main thread, you have, you have two threads, um, Unfortunately, I can't write here. So you have a main, main, uh, can you read from back there? Right. So you have a main th program, right? It created a thread to run add, add runner, right? And then it created another thread for sub, right? The way threads work is these all run in parallel, right? And how it happens is not really known to you. You just know that they are all going to run parallelly, right? Which means that you don't know what the exact order is. You don't know that the process is going to be given to here and then here and then here. It may all run at the same exact time. One of them may run, one of them may stop and, and what have you. What that means is when you are printing stuff here, right? you may see these two in, in action, right? You may see that this was ahead by some time. So this will get to go from zero to 100, right? While this was not running at the same time, right? If both of them are running at the same time, then one will increment, one will decrement, one will increment, one will decrement, and you will, you will see what you expect. But you may not see that precisely. So sometimes it'll look like, this is winning, sometimes you look like this is losing. So when you see this print, uh, print out here, you may see any of the intermediate values, right? So when you, when you, when you run this, so you have to keep running this and every time you run, you'll get a different value. You'll see sometimes 
this will go really fast and you'll see that it'll print 100 before this will start to decrement it, right? So that's, that's the notion of a thread. You can, you can run this program many times with, with a sufficiently large number of as, as a data or input. And every time you run it, you'll see a different value, right? And that's one way of knowing what happens. So essentially, depending on which machine you run, you'll see a different value, right? So what will happen if you run this on a, on a single processor machine? So if you have three processors, then potentially all of them can run parallelly, right? If you have a single processor machine, do you expect it to be predictable or not predictable? So with the way I said it, it won't be predictable, right? Are they just going to run sequentially? And so by the time you get down to the end, the other two processors will run for it? It may or may not do that. We'll see why in a little bit. But essentially, it may or may not, even in a single processor, it may or may not run, right? Because when you create a thread, you give control over when that happens to the operating system. It may be a lot more predictable than if you have a multiple processor machine, right? But the beauty of this is, now I can, I can create as many threads as I want, and if everything worked fine, if I was running on a single processor machine, it'll go at one time. If I ran it on a three processor machine, it'll go three times as fast as a single processor machine, right? So it can do this at the same time as this at the same time as this, right? And that may be preferable for some of the operations. So the, the the function called, the system called pthread, pthread join says, wait for all the other threads to finish and come back. So once the add and, and, and the subtract finishes, he'll come here, right? So if everything goes as, as you expect, this sum will be zero, right? Anything up here may be undefined, right? But as you'll see that even this may not be zero, and that's, that's because of um, how the way the hardware is, and we'll see in a little bit, right? But essentially, this is a way for you to assign multiple processes to a, a, a process, right? So this is an example of how you, you tell the operating system that you could use multiple processors, right? For the most part, you have no idea how the operating system is going to schedule you. You have no idea how it's going to run all those things. But if you want multiple processors, you have to tell the operating system, I want multiple processors. And the way you tell the operating system and the way you manage that is to use threads. Because if you don't, the operating system does not know that your program is, is such a way that you can do these things in parallel. So it cannot give you more, process, more processors. So your, process, your system cannot use the benefits of the stuff, right? So can you think of an example of how you would use threads for, let's say, you're doing PowerPoint, right? Can you imagine how you would do, or let's say, Word, right? In Word, can you think of how you may use threads to make something good? Yeah? Um, one thread is doing spell checking. Okay. Exactly. So one of the ways you can do that is you can now have one thread doing spell checking, right? And you can go wild and say one thread is doing grammar checking, one thread can do spell checking, or what have you, right? So on a single processor machine, you won't notice much difference. On a, if you go to multiple, you know, if you go to like 40 core machine, you can have all the processes basically helping you with the stuff. You know, so spell checking is happening as you type, and then it's doing a grammar check. You can also do much more complicated spell checking. Right? You don't have to be concerned with, because the other way, you, you have to have sequential. So if you have to do a very complicated spell check, Right? If it's doing a lot of computation, you can't type this stuff. You can't use the, the processor. Now you can actually run a very complicated uh, spell checking, very complicated grammar checking simultaneously. So as, as Intel makes, uh, or the hardware manufacturer makes more cores, your system will look, appear to be faster and faster and more complex stuff. Right? So any of the modern programs, if they don't do threading, you probably don't want them because they don't use the full capacity of your machine. So if you buy like something like PowerPoint, uh, uh, Photoshop, or something, right? Photoshop, you, you would like these to use all the processing to do stuff for you. And, and so thre threading is a very important um, abstraction, right? So the, 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 the good stuff is thre threading makes the processes responsive, right? Because now you have a way of assigning, getting more processes than what you get before. 
And it's a way of resource sharing. It's so easy to share, right? I don't have to do anything. I don't have to create anything. Anything in the whole process is free to be available to anybody else, right? And as we'll see that this is, this is maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, right? It's a bad thing because now you have to, in a mental picture, keep track of all these threads. If you have, like, say, 1,000 threads running, you have to know what all of them are doing at the same time, right? If one thread goes ahead and modifies something which affects everything, debugging these things will be very hard, right? And resource allocation is easy because it's all, from operating system perspective, it may be uh, one thread, and you can use multiple processes. How many of you used threads before, thread, threaded program before? Which language did you use for threads? C. C? C. How many of you use threads in Java? OK, that's only one person, right? So if you use threads in Java, it's a lot, lot more easy, right? If you use, so you basically call a method runnable. And creating a new thread in Java is much more easier than what you see in, in, in C, right? Um, because it, it, you know, it takes care of most of the stuff for you. Um, but you, uh, you know, this is one of the one of the cases that you may need to learn how to use threads, uh, just because of the way the new hardware is, right? And, and I, I don't think we have a class which actually ta talks teaches you how to use threads. Um, but essentially, that that's a that's that's the abstraction, right? So the the stuff that we worry about is how this threading library would have to be built, right? So the notion of threads is like in a program you call. You, 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 you say thread create, and that creates your different threads. The above should this be implemented, right? It can be implemented either at the user as a library or by the, by the, the, the kernel may know about these threads, right? The number one thing you need to remember, which applies to here and other places, is every time I have to do a system call, every time I have to call into the operating system, things are slow, right? Because I have to go from a user mode to the kernel mode, then I have to come back, right? I can't just go. I can't just go in like like I'm doing a normal program. I have to kind of stop myself, do a system call, and jump into the kernel. And usually, when you do this jump, operating system can schedule something else, right? One of the things you should remember is, even though operating system is supposed to be the supervisor, it's not running all the time. It only runs when you let the operating system run, right? If you have a while one loop and you're going through the loop, operating system cannot interrupt you, right? So it interrupts you by keeping a timer or what have you, right? So when you call a system call, you're telling the operating system, I need help, right? So that means operating system gets control. That means it can do whatever it wants. It can actually give you control immediately or it can do something else, right? So you as a programmer don't want to call operating system all that much because every time you call, you're kind of giving up your control to the operating system. You have to pay the penalty to do this crossing, and you have to do all the stuff. So one way to avoid this is to do what you do with printf, which is you have a library which does buffering and stuff for the most part, and only call the operating system when it has to, right? And you do the same thing here. You, have a, you may have a library which does threading control. It can go to the operating system, get some threads, and then do the manipulation and give them stuff back to you, so that way, you don't have to keep asking the operating system all the time. So potentially, you could be much faster, right? But on the other hand, if the kernel, unless the kernel knows about, so if the kernel knows about threads, it can do something nicer. It, it may decide to do whatever policy it can do within the kernel. So this is a trade-off. I mean, whether you want it to be simple or what have you, or whether you want the operating system to control. So that's the notion of a user-level threads or kernel-level threads. With the user-level threads, your threads, the operating system does not know anything about it, so you're free to do whatever you want within the within the operating system, within your program. And the with the kernel level thread, the kernel knows everything. But you have to pay the price that every time you want to switch, you want to do stuff, right? And some of the examples of, of user level threads are pass XP threads, which is what the Unix and, and, and systems use, and Windows threads and Java threads. The, those are all user level threads because those, those threads are not necessarily known to the operating system. Those libraries will call the operating system to get some threads and hand them out to you, right? And, and, and in a moment, we'll see that it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. It could be a many-to-one or one-to-many, and so on and so forth. Um, whereas the kernel-level threads, 
the kernel knows about that you're running all these threads, that means it can give you more, more process, more resources and stuff, right? The idea here is if the user level thread package only knows to ask for one kernel thread, right? It knows only to ask one kernel thread and give them to, to you, right? Then you as application programmer cannot really use the full power of the machine, right? Because the library knows to only ask for one thread, so it's asking one thread and giving it to you. So you can't really do much, and you can't really tell the kernel, you can't really say, I want to talk to the Linux, I don't want to talk to you, because you're talking to the library. Right? So the kernel thread, the operating system knows everything, so it can, it can potentially help you, right? So the, 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 the different ways of you, uh, for you to map this stuff is from the user level, how many, how many you want, uh, to a many to one, right? So if you run this pthread library, you may create multiple threads, but all of them get mapped to one single thread of the operating system. So the operating system only knows one thread given to your pthreads library, but you get to use you get to create a program with multiple threads, and all of them have to be managed exactly by the um, by the by a uh, by a library, right? And yeah. actually, it's in the slide. But what, what do you think would would be the problem with this approach? So you have multiple threads, right? And all of them are seem like they're going parallelly, but. The, current, the operating system already knows that you're running one thread. It only gave you one thread to all this library, right? So you're multiplexing your whole threads into this one thread, right? Yes. Sorry. I mean, uh, I, maybe um, the, uh, I mean, the processor, like every all the system resources would just be going to that one thread. Yeah. And, yeah, you only get, I mean, from an operating system perspective, you only get one, one level unit of service, right? So one of the problems, you know, which, which kind of mentioned here is, if you ever call, if one of the threads that you have calls something that needs some kernel support and is waiting for it, while it's waiting for it, nobody else can run, right? So when you do a system call, most of the system calls are blocking, right? So when you do a read call, when you do a read for, let's say, a thousand bytes, right? And this happens to be on the hard disk, right? When you write a normal program, when you do a read, your read will not succeed till that hundred bytes are read, a thousand bytes are read, or return some error happens, right? You don't think about it in normal programs because you have only one thread. So when you do a read, you know that the read is not going to finish immediately. It's going to wait till all the contents are read, right? That's the semantics you want, and that's particularly fine. But fine. But if you have multiple threads, and each one of them is doing a read, right? So while one is waiting, that thread cannot tell, OK, I'm part of a multiple thread user library, right? Because the kernel only knows that you have only one thread. So that it looks like one thread came and asked for the read call, the kernel will block you. If that thread is blocked, then the whole system is blocked. All the other threads are blocked, even though they could potentially run. Does that make sense? So even though you have multiple user level threads, the operating system does not know anything about it. So it thinks that you have only one thread, and so it doesn't re really care when you do a blocking call. So when you have multiple threads, like a Peter library, from a, with the, if you have a single system uh, thread, then if one of them blocks, then the whole thing will block, right? So the way you get around that is those libraries will give you two different calls. They'll give you one call which is blocking, one call which is not blocking. The non-blocking call would try to figure out if this call would block. So it'll have to do some massaging to make sure that the kernel will not block on something. So the library becomes more complicated because it has to deal with this stuff. Right? It has to deal with the concept that it knows about threads, but when it goes to the kernel, the kernel is not giving you any feedback because the kernel does not know what you're doing. So you have to kind of figure out if this call would block. If you don't do a good job, if you mess up, then the whole everything will, will block. Right? And the, one of the ways you get, a, get away from that is to not just get one thread, but multiple threads and manage multiple threads. So you don't usually see the problem. Right? So what happens is, I will go and ask the kernel for, let's say, three threads, and I give whatever thread you want at the user level. 
I tried to put it into one of these threads at the library level. So even if you block on one, you may be okay because other ones are running, right? So these are different ways you can manage this stuff. Um, and we'll, we'll continue with this and then uh, wrap up this section on the next lecture. Right? See you guys on Monday. <laughs>